I remember years ago, <clears throat> primarily in my teen years, I think before the age of 20, and maybe a little ways after that, I don't, it's interesting to think about, but I, I used to have this sensation, I, rem I remember particularly when I lived at home, and it was, it was, it was this, com I, very difficult to explain, completely, <clears throat> Um, painful, compressed sense of agony and longing and fear. There was a, this, this sense of fear like death was with me and I was without help. It, it was kind of like that. I mean, that's, that's kind of how it felt. But putting that into words... I mean, that's a good way to describe it, but putting it into words feels like... It just feels very limiting. Um, and I haven't felt that way in a long time, and I'm glad about that. It makes me realize I've grown tremendously. I know I keep reminding myself when I come up against different aggravations and anxieties that there are ways I used to feel that I don't feel anymore. There are fears I used to have that I don't have anymore. I remember that one actually in particular, and I think I, I used to feel it when I was, I don't know if it was, I was right on the cusp of sleep, sleep, I don't know that it had to, something about a low blood sugar too, like there was a low blood sugar effect that would make me feel vulnerable in the cusp of, a cusp of being asleep and I would, I would feel very fragile, and then it was like, this death feeling, this feeling of not being able to hold on or, or being uncertain in, in, in that fear. <clears throat> and that's something that I've proud, I really am proud that I've outgrown. I'm really proud of that. I really feel like, you know, wow, I remember that and, and the, the memory of it and the recognition that I've grown beyond it feels phenomenal it's just like such a sigh of relief but I say that with a I say that with a bit of reservation because I feel like I feel like those teenage anxieties and those late teen anxieties were convenient in a way. They made sense for the time and, and what I was going through, especially since I was a smoker and, and all that, all that stuff. I get these horrendous low blood sugars that would just Oh, knock me out. I'd wake up. I woke up one time with a low blood sugar, and my friend was had arrived at the house, and he started interacting with me. And it's like good thing he did because I I was so nearly comatose, and I was trying to talk to him, and I was like, uh, uh, and I felt like I was having this out of body experience, almost like what. Some people might describe a PC tr PCP trip feeling like, although I'm sure, well, I'm sure it was it was intense. It was intense enough. I mean, I it was very intense and it was it was alarming. And I remember not being able to really leave the room or not feeling like I had to. Like I was just groggy and I was just trying to wake up. And then finally, when I did leave the room and I treated my blood sugar and I started to get better, it was it became. I became more conscious of, of how I was feeling. Um, I, I feel like, in a lot of ways, In a lot of 
of ways I want to change the, the camera settings here. Let's see. Oh, that's better. Oh, that's better. So. I was in Palo Alto and I was at work and then I and this cop took my license plate off because somebody I'm 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 guessing I'm I'm really assuming that somebody at my my apartment complex, one of my tenants, fucked with my license plate and rearranged the letters some of the um, letters on my license plate, um, made the L to make it look like an E and and made another letter out to look like an A, and. They did to fuck with me, and I really can't be certain who it is. I can only speculate. And, um... I went through all this tension and anxiety about the whole ordeal. To make a long story short, I called the officer who took the license plate who accused me of vandalizing my own, who sabotaging my own license plate in order to, according to her, she thought I did it because I was trying to beat red light cameras and bridge tolls and, and whatnot. And, it's just sad. I mean, it's just sad. I don't know how I could have explained it away where she wouldn't have given, given me a citation. I feel like I kind of would have had to have been a 94-year-old hum, hunchbacked Buddhist monk coming down from the Himalayas in order for her to kind of be on my side. You know, like, oh, well, this poor old man could never have done this. It doesn't make sense. But... In a way, I feel like I, I sabotaged myself in the, in the sense that I didn't really channel my, um, I didn't really channel my, I didn't channel my anger in, in, in the correct way, I didn't channel my, um, <laughs> my sense of outrage uh, in the right way I didn't channel I didn't use my sense of, of I wasn't a adamant I was angry I was frustrated and I told her I insisted that I didn't do this and she brought it down to a, a, a she brought the citation down for a misdemeanor and I wish I knew who did it, but then again, I kind of wish I don't, because it, you know it's like it's almost like a waste of time. It's really a waste of time. You you get to learn these things. I mean, it it really is a learning experience. I mean, it has to be for me. It has to be. You know, I mean, I guess other people have had the learning experience a, a few times, and, and it, it, it gets annoying after a while. But you know, things like this don't usually happen to me. Um, rarely something like this comes along and I have to deal with something like this not not in in legal um, not in the legal world or, or, or interactions with police um, but I, you know I owe a dentist lots of money because the insurance overlapped or, or didn't didn't apply when I thought it did or something like that mm -hmm. and um, uh, 
I don't really want to be angry about it. I just, uh, you know, I do. I, I, but this weekend we went to the Maker's Fair, and I was really angry. I was really bent out of shape, and it started where I went to put some deodorant on. You know, big deal. I went to put some deodorant on, and I go to my backpack where the deodorant should be, and there's no deodorant there. It's just gone. And I can speculate in. Whatever I can, I can, I can worry about that deodorant and where it might be for the, the end of my, until the end of my days, and it, it wouldn't make any, any difference. I mean, I really got pissed off, and I, I bet myself out of shape, and it didn't make any sense. And I feel like I don't have any energy to do this fucking video. So we get to the Maker's Fair and I'm really angry, I'm really pissed off, and I'm thinking about being pissed off and how I'm pissed off. And I went through different, I fluctuated from being content to feeling pissed off to... being more pissed off. I had an inkling of, of, of a realization today that If you really want to, you know, I really want to live my dreams. I want to live, everyone wants to live their dream and, and, and do exactly what they love. And I, and I really was questioning the mode of operation in having to do other things, in a, other things for other people. Um, it sounds weird when you put it like that. It almost sounds like, well, that's why it's meant to be. But, because I, I mean, I, in a way, there's, there is that component where it feels appropriate for me to be a resident manager of an apartment complex. Like I feel like it's, a, it's a good place for me. But I feel like I was saying to myself today, what if I had won a hundred million dollars when I was twenty? And I was thinking about all the things I went through in my twenties. And I was, I was saying, well, those things, you know, I was, I was saying, well, those things still would have been there. It's just, you know, and, and it would have been different, though. It would have looked different. And it's fascinating to think about, like, how would it have looked different? And you get to moments where you're like, well, ultimately there would have been accomplishments that just... couldn't happen unless you had had a hundred million dollars but you think about those accomplishments and you think but that's the reality I want in my life not not necessarily the hundred million dollars but the ability to make a film with enough money to be able to make the film full-time like a full-time full-time job you know eight to five or whatever three to midnight um 6 p.m to 5 a.m you know however it works doing that full time and, and working on film and and you get to realizing it could be so much different it could be that that is how you want it that's your ideal that's that's what you that's how you want it and you get to thinking all the things that wouldn't have happened, like I wouldn't have worked at the pharma at the pharmaceutical company. I wouldn't have worked at Theravance. It it really doesn't seem like it, it seems like so fucking what was Theravance a, a learning experience? In a lot of ways, it was sure. It allowed me to learn. Maybe in the stillness of it, maybe in the quietness of it, maybe in the in the stillness and maybe that empty lobby meant something. It sure felt appropriate when I started. It's such a weird um, contrast. It's almost, it really is bittersweet. It's almost, 
you know, when I think about my childhood and how how excited and colorful and neon and bright and, and happy childhood was and, and the ways that seasons would transform and they would make your imagination fly and your imagination would um, your imagination would gravitate and go along with locations as you change locations as you travel to visit you know we, we would go to visit my father in Fresno and um, our father my brother my brother and me we would go to visit dad and uh, Como presentadora de noticias de un... It, um, I'm looking at a picture of the strangest insect. You remember the, the vibrancy and the, and the color and, and what was happening and how exciting that felt. And then, and then you, you, the contrast between that and then becoming an adult, graduated from college and working in an empty lobby with no paintings and no nothing. And having, you know, I mean, just, and, and, and thinking that that's appropriate, being brainwashed into thinking that that's, I don't, I don't. I mean, maybe that. I think that's too harsh. I don't think I, I was brainwashed into thinking anything. I think I knew what it was like to go to a nine-to-five job and have a boss looking over your shoulder and that kind of fucking bullshit, and what it was like to not have that on a day on a day-to-day -day basis and do what the you know what what your heart desired. And writing was what my heart is what my heart desires and and was then and. It just was, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And you get to thinking, but it wouldn't have been under different circumstances. And maybe there's a reason for that. It's, it's interesting, but I, I feel like All that inspiration I felt when I was a child and everything that was bright and colorful and, and fascinating. Should be with me today. It, it, should, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be gone. Like I wonder, I wonder how Stephen King feels from the time he was 13 years old to the time he to, to uh, into his 30s and 40s and 50s I mean it, it seems like it, it, there has to be well, there, just, <laughs> there definitely has to be enough components in the human mind in order for those components to take delight and 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 exception what they're experiencing and really go full bore and, and try to live that um, ex that really that excitement and that you know pure neon light in the, in the flow of how it feels to meet new people and go to new places and and how that felt when I was a kid and, and the inspiration and everything think everything felt different and there's this kind of rock solid bombardment of of anxiety and depression and tranquility like i just want to tranquilize myself because i'm bullshit i'm i'm fucking bullshit at the police i'm i'm just you know the Palo Alto police um this 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 police officer working for the Palo Alto she, she <laughs> she takes my license plate and, and accuses me of a crime that 
I didn't commit and it could possibly cost me a hundred two hundred dollars hundred ninety four dollars and so you you know the, and then you just want to fucking take a pill and drink and go to sleep and pray and then you, you know you're on probation and you want to take a pill and sleep and you wonder what happened like where was that shiny moment I mean I, I remember walking around high school and I was you were in loads of fucking pain though I mean there were there was a different kind of pain but I just remember that fascination with with things and I and I know it's here now it's just the, the these dark gray clouds get in the way and they cover it up sometimes and that's not fun it's here it exists it's not gone I didn't destroy it it hasn't been destroyed It's just that it takes more to establish its new place. It takes effort, and it takes drive, and it takes the willpower to do that. And moving forward on United Flesh, you know, is the way to do that. That's why you feel that giddy, excited feeling inside you when you think about progressing with United Flesh, because you want to progress. You know, if you didn't, you would you would say, oh, I have to admit to myself I'm not into this. And I'm proud to say that that's just not true. Next time somebody asks you if you'll ever get bored of filmmaking, instead of responding how you work on a project and how frequently you work on projects or don't work on projects, tell them that with you it's an addiction. It's been an addiction since you were five. And it, it, it wasn't a choice. It wasn't something you woke up with. It was something that was there. And uh, you just ended up realizing it when you were 13.